What are the five biggest questions the Bengals must answer this offseason now that the season has concluded? Let's break it down. everyone, welcome to the Bengals Beat Podcast. I'm your host, Kelsey Conway, here at the Inquirer Studios with Bengals Beat Podcast producer Sam Green and Phil Didion. And we are here to wrap up the season. The Bengals played their final game on Sunday against the Browns. And now the clock turns to the offseason. And for the Bengals, it's going to be one that is going to be interesting. And they have plenty of decisions to make. And we're going to break some of those decisions down today and talk about what are some of the most important ones. But it's a place that the Bengals haven't been in a while, and that is not playing in the postseason. It's not what anyone on the coaching staff wanted, but things, as Joe Burrow said, just never really took off for this team this year. You can point to a number of different reasons why the Bengals aren't playing in the postseason, but the bottom line is they are not for the first time in a long time, it feels like, but really only two years because when the Bengals took the NFL by surprise back in 2021 and went to the Super Bowl. And then the year after that, they followed it up with a trip to the AFC Championship. So they are used to playing deep into January. So this is a little bit of a different territory for everyone involved. And they are hoping to use this time to correct things and make decisions that will put them back in a position next year to be playing this weekend on Wild Card Weekend or maybe even having a bye because they played so well during the season that they earned a bye and will pick up in the divisional round. But the bottom line is the Bengals want to be playing in the playoffs every single year and this year they are not. And the number one reason you could say the Bengals didn't make the postseason was Joe Burrow season-ending wrist surgery. But there's still a lot of other factors that played into that. And even though they lost Burrow for the season, they still finished with a winning record, which I know is very important to a lot of people in the building. So let's break down some of the biggest questions this team has to answer. And the way it works in the NFL world is the calendar really starts to speed up here. The playoffs start and then there's a little bit of some downtime after the Super Bowl, but then you go straight into the combine, then free agency, then league owners meetings. And then next thing you know, it's the draft and players are back in the building. So there's not a lot of downtime. And for the Bengals, they have a lot of very important decisions that have a deadline to them. So let's break it down from, in my opinion, most important to least important, but they are all very important decisions that this team is going to have to figure out. And I have this as a story up on Cincinnati.com if you want to check it out um, for more information, but let's, let's get to it. For me, the first and the biggest decision this team has to make is what are they going to do with their wide receivers in T. Higgins and Tyler Boyd? Both are going Going to be free agents as their deal expired with the Bengals and both new heading into that final game. That could likely be their final time wearing orange and black coming out of the tunnel. And T. Higgins was unable to play due to a hamstring injury, but Tyler Boyd was able to play and he talked a little bit about it after the game. And, and he's very uncertain about what the future holds. And right now, the Bengals are going to have to decide. Do you let both walk and hit free agency and just count on bringing in younger guys um, as they did a couple years ago when they drafted T. Higgins and then Jamar Chase and loaded up their receiver room on those rookie contracts? They're going to have to make these decisions with knowing the number that Joe Burrow is going to start costing this team in terms of his contract. Really, the contract won't set in in terms of being an issue for this team until next year. But regardless, the Bengals are planners. They want to plan for the future and give themselves an opportunity to not really have to be in a position where one year they're they're really struggling to be able to fill positions of need because they've spent so much money in other areas. So what they do with T. Higgins and Tyler Boyd for me is the number one decision this team has to make. The writing on the wall seems like it's going to be the end of Tyler Boyd's tenure in Cincinnati when they drafted Charlie Jones last year at the slot wide receiver out of Purdue, but they could also decide we want to keep him around for a couple more years. He takes a, a team-friendly deal. 
I get the sense that Tyler Boyd's going to want to test free agency and see what he can get on the market. And so we will see what happens there. But the real attention is going to go to T. Higgins. And I reported prior to the season that the Bengals and T. Higgins and his representation were unable to get to a contract extension prior to the season, which basically meant it was hard to see both sides being able to come to agreement on a long-term deal after the season because of Jamar Chase. If Jamar Chase was not on this team, it's a safe bet that the Bengals would have locked up T. Higgins. But the Bengals now know that Jamar Chase is eligible for his extension. And if you're going to have to choose between Jamar Chase and T. Higgins the decision is going to be to keep Chase. So what does that mean for Higgins? Well, the Bengals can do three things here. They can tag him and the decision to, if they are going to tag him, actually comes in the middle of February and it's a in the middle of February through the first couple of weeks of March decision. I have the exact dates in my story. February 20th to March 5th is when they have to decide if they are going to place the tag on him. If they place the tag on him, here's the two options that they can go from there. They can tag him and then try and trade him to a team and get draft picks in return. But in order to do that, you have to have a team interested in T. Higgins and you have to know that going into when you decide to put the tag on him. Because if that team doesn't pan out, you are stuck with a pretty high number for T. Higgins services for just one year. And it's looking like it could be about $21 million for the wide receiver tag. That's a lot of money to pay someone for just one season, especially when you know you're probably not going to get to a common ground on a long-term extension after next season. And the Bengals are not going to look at next season as this is a Super Bowl or bust season. They view every year with Joe Burrow as they have an opportunity to win a Super Bowl. But this year is different than last year because of the roster. The roster is completely different. They've got a lot more holes than they did heading into this past season. So they're going to have to make a decision. Either they tag T. Higgins and trade him They tag him and decide, we don't care if we're spending $21 million on him for just one year. It's what we view can help our team the most right away. Or they let him hit free agency, which would mean they do not apply a tag on him. And that would signal the end of his career in Cincinnati. So that is the deal with T. Higgins. All right, now let's move on. Is Dax Hill the future starting safety for this team? That is one of the other big questions that they have to figure out. When the Bengals knew they were going to have to sign Joe Burrow, they really counted on being able to hit on their draft picks in terms of players in the secondary because it's really hard to have a quarterback that takes up as much of the salary cap as Joe Burrow does and be able to pay the amount they're going to have to pay Chase and to pay all these players in the secondary. If you look at the way the Chiefs have done their business with Patrick Mahomes' contract, they've really had to double down on having rookie and first and second year players in the secondary and really hitting home on them in the draft. Well, the Bengals hoped that when they moved on from Jesse Bates, that Dax Hill, who they drafted to be Jesse's replacement, would take a step. It was a very Up and down year for Dax. And unfortunately, he got worse as the season went on. And now there are some questions about, is he capable of being a starting free safety in defensive coordinator Lou Anarumo's scheme? It was a very adamant situation for Dax in terms of his mistakes were glaring and they were mistakes that can't happen in a second year for a player. And especially when you are in charge of making sure that the whole defense is lined up from the back line, he struggled with communication. He struggled with tackling and that leaves the Bengals coaching staff and front office wondering, those are the basics. Those are what we require our players to be able to do. If he's struggling with those two things in week 17, is he, is the light ever going to go on for him? And that's what I think they are really going to have to decide and go through all of his game tape and make a decision. Because if they don't think he can be the starter, they're going to have to probably go and sign a veteran safety, which I fully expect them to do regardless of if Dax is the starter or not. Because one, you want to bring in some competition, but two, that 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 room is just far too young. And Jordan Battle is only going to be in his second season as a starter. And Dax, it really hasn't 
gone the way that they had hoped so far. So expect the Bengals to be in the market for a free safety. But the price is going to depend on if he's going to be a starting free safety or someone they view as just a veteran presence. So they've got to figure out what to do with Dax Hill. What is the plan to fix the run game? A year after (laughs) we spent a lot of time last offseason talking about the Bengals wanting and needing to be more explosive in the run game, we are back to square one with this topic in terms of the Bengals really struggling to run the ball. And that was even worse this year as they finished number 30th in the NFL in rushing offense a year after finishing number 29 in rushing offense. The Bengals have to get more explosive in the run game, especially to be able to help take some pressure off of Joe Burrow and the amount of hits he's taking. So what do they do with the run game? We will see. They're likely going to revamp their running back room. As far as Joe Mixon's future, that will continue to be a part of the conversation. But it's not just Joe Mixon. What are they going to do with Chris Evans and Travion Williams? In my opinion, I think the Bengals will sign at least two running backs this offseason. They they should have revamped it last year, and they decided not to. And here they are again. They took a step backwards. And I think continuing on with the cast of characters that you have this year, there has to be some sort of change. Where that comes, I don't know. They will have to decide that. But look for the running back room to be revamped because Frank Pollock, the Bengals run game coordinator, and the Bengals offensive coordinator, Brian Callahan. Like those guys are all safe in terms of if Brian Callahan becomes a head coach, we will see. But the scheme and the coaching isn't going to change. So that means it's up to personnel to change. So we'll see what type of moves they make. What is the plan at right tackle? You likely saw the end of Jonah Williams' career in Cincinnati, and that means the Bengals will once again be in the market for a starting right tackle. It has seems like a position they have really not been able to lock down and get a starter for years now. And Jonah Williams was someone they thought about moving on from last year, but they didn't have a good enough option to put at right tackle that... They ended up wanting him to come back and play and they moved him to right tackle and he actually did pretty well there. But he's probably going to command a lot of money on the free agency market and so that would leave an opening for the Bengals. Do they decide to go the draft route and draft a right tackle in the draft? We will see. History tells you that's probably not the smartest move for them because they've really struggled to hit on that position. But Right tackles cost a lot of money. So it's all going to go back to what are the positions that the Bengals feel like they need to go out and spend on as opposed to drafting. So this is a very important free agency draft season for the Bengals. And to wrap it up, what is the what's the plan at nose tackle? DJ Reader was in the final year of his deal. His season was cut short with a quad injury. And yes, although DJ Reader wants to be back, the future remains uncertain for him in terms of his career as the Bengal- for the Bengals because will he return as the same player? That position is way too valuable and the Bengals really struggled to stop the run and get any sort of interior pass rush even when he was healthy. The Bengals need to upgrade at the in- interior defensive tackle position. I could see them taking a giving DJ a team friendly deal because I don't think his market is going to be what it was because he's now torn his quad twice and is hitting 30 years old. But we'll see. It's a it's a bummer for him that the injury happened in a contract year when he was in line to to get another pretty hefty contract, whether it would have been in Cincinnati or somewhere else. Regardless, they are going to have to add probably two defensive tackles that can come in and be starters right away. So those are some of the biggest questions for this team. But as these months go on, they'll continue to be more questions as others get answered. And we will be able to talk about it all off season. So for now, I am going to bring in Cincinnati Inquirer columnist Jason Williams to discuss his thoughts about what he wants to see the Bengals do this off season. Well, this is the first Bengals off season that you've been the sports columnist that the Bengals have not been playing. What do you think? It's a little weird. Uh, you know, you and I were just talking right before we started rolling. Our guys uh, started clicked everything on here that you know we should be preparing to go to Kansas City right now. That's where the Bengals would be going. It's going to be incredibly cold there for the Miami Dolphins. Hmm. Um, but you know, as we as as it is. Uh, 
everyone's home in January and it is, it's a little weird. And, and I, I thought of this after, uh, particularly after the game the other day, even though they were eliminated in Kansas city, I was thinking on my drive home from the stadium after the Browns game that it's, it's a little from the story purposes. Uh, obviously I look at this neutrally. So, uh, I, you know, I'm not a fan, but I look at it from the story purposes and just from what the Bengals making the playoffs do for Cincinnati and the way we've seen how excited Cincinnati, the city, the region gets when the Bengals are in the playoffs. I'm a little saddened by the fact they're not from that standpoint, mm -hmm. because when you think back to that Super Bowl run last year's run like back to the AFC championship, just the way that it, the Cincinnati really rallies um, and, I, and I'm that's not any different than any other NFL team but what what rallies us here in Cincinnati more than than that I, I don't I don't know what does and, and especially over a you know couple week period of time well it's interesting when you look at so it a couple of things here on this topic if you this is going to be since we're talking about the Chiefs the first year since Patrick Mahomes has been in the league yeah. that he is going to have to go on the road it's amazing. potentially in the postseason. If they beat the Dolphins, the divisional round won't be an arrowhead. Yeah. And if you look at the Bengals, so like Chiefs fans have become accustomed to when the season starts in September, they're not making plans to go on vacation with their families because right. they are going to the playoffs every year. And this year, I feel like shows, and you wrote about it after the game, quarterback play is everything, but you got to hit every offseason. There's no, this isn't, this is a less important offseason. So while this is a very important offseason for the Bengals, it's not any less any more or less important than the year before. Because yeah. if you look at like the gold standards, which the Chiefs are, which Joe Burrow has said, Patrick Mahomes is the gold standard at the quarterback position. Until someone can knock him off, he's the best in the NFL. And it's hard to argue against it because consistency. Every single year, he has the Chiefs 10 plus wins. And you look at the Bengals and they lost Joe Burrow. Yes, they still won nine games, but they never really looked like the team that you'd be scared of in the postseason. Yeah. But it brings me to the point of like, the Chiefs front office does a lot of things right that, yes, a lot of it is Mahomes and Andy Reid, but like, do you know how hard that is to do every year, make the postseason, let alone host home playoff games? Like, it's it's absolutely wild when you think about it. Yeah, absolutely, because the league is not set no, up for that. Right. The league is set up to basically... I don't know what the right term is, but essentially if you're good to be punished mm -hmm. the next year, right. they give you the tougher schedule the next year. Uh, you get the lower, obviously the lower draft pick. And, uh, you know, that's all about balancing things out and just uh, everything is the parrot. The they are parity, a dynasty. Par parody of the, of the NFL is, is a real thing. And to be able to do that, uh, really, that's what that's what sets them apart. I mean, mm -hmm. that's why they're the super, reigning Super Bowl champions. Um, that's why they haven't, or you know, they will this year, but they've not played a. Well, they've been ten consecutive Let's playoffs, see. right? I remember this after the stat after the Bengals played out there. I believe it was was it ten consecutive playoffs or ten consecutive um, winning seasons? Let's see. Whatever it was, it was a staggering number. And it's like, oh, wow, that really speaks to the culture, the commitment to excellence, the um, from top to bottom of the organization in Kansas City. And uh, well, we will find yeah. the number and bring yeah. it, bring yeah, it, it back. Something along those lines. I remember um, like, they talked about it on CBS. Right. But the point is, is Joe Burrow famously said the line a couple years ago when I asked him, like, are you aware of Super Bowl windows? Because remember, all the talk heading into the season was this every is the Bengals yeah. Super Bowl window. Yet when I asked Joe, he said every year, as long as I'm playing, is a Super Bowl window. So you can tell he's trying to take the Mahomes approach of thinking like he is good enough. If you give him the right weapons, yeah. he can get this team into the postseason. And it's hard to argue 
against it because he's shown you in in two out of the four years when he's been healthy, he does. I think every year is a, is a playoff window as long as he's healthy. I don't think every year, at least looking, at least as the Bengals are right now, it's hard to say every year is a Super Bowl window. But right. Definitely when he's healthy and rolling, every year is a playoff window. I, I think you can say that. And obviously, yeah, Joe Burrow is going to say everyone every year is a Super Bowl win, of course. Five conference title games before the age of 30. That's bonkers. That's crazy. Yeah. For Mahomes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All in Arrowhead. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah. Yeah. And I think they've been, I think then it's been like, and then there was another stat about they've gone well, 10 consecutive winning season or 10 consecutive playoffs, which uh, seems like that's a lot of playoffs for 10 straight years. But anyway. Yeah. Um, I get what you're saying, though. Yeah. But let's. So since we're talking about this, because I know this is a point that you have talked a lot about that I wanted to bring you on. Since we're talking about how the Chiefs do this. And yes, Mahomes is part of it, but it's a team sport and a team game. In order to host home playoff games and to ensure that you get a chance to play yeah. in the postseason, you cannot start 0-2 anymore. That right. needs to be donezo. I remember writing the story that said the percentage of teams that make the playoffs after starting 0-2 is like very low. And everybody was like, oh, we did it last year. Uh, you know, I had people comment, yeah. we did it. Th we did it this year. We did it. That has got to go. The Bengals played with fire and it worked for them two years in a row, but I think it became a crutch for them this year in terms yeah. of they thought mm, just I because agree. in years past that they could do it again. Let's look at some of the top seeded teams and how they started the season. Of course, the Chiefs lost to the Lions on Thursday night football to start the season, but then they rebounded yeah. with a win in week two. Um, the 49ers, let's look at how they started the season. These are all teams. The 49ers are going to have home field advantage throughout the playoffs. And that, right, like that's that's yeah. the goal for the Bengals next, right? Like they've shown that they can get to the playoffs. Now it's about can you secure the one or two seed in the AFC? That's something that they want to do. And, and like Zach Taylor talked about the other, the goal is to win the Super Bowl. Right. Like, uh, the easiest we, way to do that is good to, enough to get there. Yeah. And I got to win it. Right. And the easiest way to do that is if the road goes through Cincinnati. Definitely. So the 49ers started the season two and oh, beat the Steelers 30 to seven and beat the Rams 30 to 23. Let's see what the Ravens did. Or the Raven. Well, one of their wins was here. Yes. But I believe they won their op season opener. Um, let's see. But my point is, is if you look at the 49ers, yes, they beat the Texans. The top two seeds started 2-0. and Right. So and you, look at, you look at the Steelers and uh, I mean, th that was a team that just looked absolutely terrible at, at a big stretch of the season. They're in the playoffs and you go back and remember, this was a this was a story and at one Browns. point about how how hard their training camp is and mm -hmm. how tough Tomlin is on them and training camp. And I I, I have to believe that that's part of why they were able to tough through some part of part of it, a and small part, I'm sure. But like part of why they were able to tough through some tough times. So they won their They lost their week. The Steelers lost their week one game to the 49ers. They were outmatched. You're fine with that loss. They beat the Browns at home. And not only is that a division win, that is not getting beat two weeks in a row. Right. So the Bengals... Go back to week one, the rain, Joe not playing in training camp. They had all these excuses. Yeah. Then you cannot come back in week two in your home opener and lose to the Ravens. And now you're 0-2 in the division, 0-2 in the AFC. You're 0-2 to start. The biggest number one thing for me this offseason is going to be how do they get Joe Burrow to get through a training camp healthy? And I yeah. asked him in a season-ending press conference, how do you do it? Are you changing something with your workout routine? Like, in my opinion, every stone should be turned from the franchise and him in terms of does he need more, I don't know, maybe like more other trainings, changing up, whatever. But yeah. they should look into it because it is that important for this team to get him to be able to play in training camp. And the second 
biggest thing for this team is going to be how does Zach Taylor get them moving with a sense of urgency yeah. in the first two weeks of the season? I just think there has to be I, I respect Zach Taylor tremendously. I think he's a, a really good head coach. There's certainly things to question about. Agreed. Uh, some things, some decisions that he makes, but you could say that for a lot of head coaches uh, or every head coach. Uh, and, and the two things you really question about Zach Taylor are uh, the training camp approach, training camp slash preseason approach, and you know some of the play calling stuff. Um, but you're right. I, I think they've used that approach to training camp as a crutch like hey look it worked these two times well guess what it's not worked because they've started 0-2 and and this season and and I believe was Zach Taylor's first season obviously before Zit Joe Burrow and it didn't work in those two seasons so you're two for four on that Um, because what they were one and one the other the other other, he's five seasons under Zach Taylor Um, I I, I just think something has to change there Um, I, I if you're just to ask my guess on whether it will change, I don't see it changing. Um, the Bengals aren't, they're not great with change and the way they approach things. Um, that, you know, I think this will, this is another example. Like I said, I think Zach Taylor's going to say, Hey, look, we got the Super Bowl this year. You can lean on the fact that you didn't have Joe Burrow, but then I think you can go back and say um, not having Joe Burrow healthy and then with the combination of the fact that the rest of the team wasn't ready really hurt them in the early season this year. So let's just say if Jake Browning had been ready or they had at least known what they had. So I think that's a positive going into next year. And I wrote this too, like – I think if you were to just sort of strip away from a fan standpoint, the disappointment of the season and down the stretch, like one of the big positives was that Jake Brown, they, and we know how important the backup quarterback is in the NFL now. And the fact that he's under, I I always say club control, that's a baseball term, but Mm -hmm. the fact that the Bengals control is is his contract for the next few years, I think is a really good thing. And knowing Joe Burrow's injury history. So now I think if, if they, toughen up some in in training camp and the preseason and if joe burrow for whatever reason god willing or god you know happens um he you know is hurt or dinged up that you can turn to jake browning and think okay uh maybe they won't start slow this year because that's a guy that you know you know now can go win you a game or two right uh, can he go win you on games over an entire season we don't know that obviously but Certainly, I think Jake Browning has proven down the stretch here that he's a competitor. They have a chance. He's given them a chance to win. And uh, what did they go four and three with him and take out the two Pittsburgh games? And he was he was good otherwise. Right. So, yeah, I think that you start Owen two next year that then becomes a mental thing that this team might struggle to overcome. Yeah, but, we'll but I'm have- glad you brought that because I think that's a big deal. And I think that's. I, you know, I it's going to be a big story in the off season here, leading up to training him, and I'm sure Zach Taylor is probably going to get tired of probably yeah. answering questions about that. But he's always great with the media. Right. And, uh, he's good. And he's got a thick skin. Some and, sort of part, some sort of training camp should be uncomfortable for the players. I read a story yeah. about. Um, Former players and coaches were asked about Andy Reid's training camp, and apparently it's the hardest training camp. Even for a guy like Travis Kelsey, who's been a veteran, he stays on him, and like he's notorious for just like being very demanding in training camp. And it's not to say that they need to be running sprints if they drop the ball. Like It's not peewee football, but there just has to be a greater sense of urgency and from the coaching staff in terms of getting the guys ready to go. And I think this was a big learning lesson for everyone involved this year that I think they can no longer afford this slow start situation. So um, you kind of moved us to our next topic, but let's go, let's break this into two segments. What do you feel good about with the Bengals this off season? And what do you not feel good about that you want? change so you can take whichever one first i'll say what i feel good about is uh i feel good about the fact that uh jake browning i just mentioned that i feel good about the fact that they now know 
They have a reliable backup quarterback. They went into last season not knowing that after Brandon Allen went elsewhere. Um, I, I, I think that certainly uh, I think the receiver position is actually in good shape, even though they're going to lose Tyler Boyd, even though the uncertainty of T Higgins, whether he's going to be franchise tagged or go elsewhere, I actually do think the receiver position, I, I don't think you need three superstar wide receivers in the league. Um, I, I think you need one. They have that. Um, you need to spread some of those resources out elsewhere. I, 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 I feel generally I feel good about the linebacking position. I think it, it had some struggles this year because of other areas of the defense. Um, but otherwise, I, you know, I wrote my column the other day on the flip side. Now uh, they really need to address the trenches and um, the offensive line, the defensive line. So they, everything starts there. And I think, you know, once you address those two areas, you've got to get another starting running back. And then, you you know, you got to get another starting a veteran starting safety or fix the safety position. Uh, you know, how many players is that over? I, I, I don't know. I, I know obviously running backs one and safety is one. So that's two players. I don't know how many players that is that are right now on the offensive line or on the defensive line. Certainly Jonah Williams, who I think you could probably argue was their most consistent offensive lineman this year, this year is going to go elsewhere. And, and he was fantastic this year. He changed positions and that was a hard transition early on for him. You, you did some great stuff on that. Um, so you're going to lose him. And so now that you got that hole to fix and the interior of the line just wasn't good enough this year and they need to fix that. I don't, I don't, you know, there's contracts that they're in right now. I don't, I'm not sure exactly how they go about that. Um, it, you know, and it's, it's easy for me to say, and, you know, I said in my call, they, they got to do better in the draft. Well, it's easy to say that, uh, they got to evaluate players better. They've got to, you know, you've got to be better at evaluating who to bring back and who to let go right. and free agency. You know, last year, I think you can look back and say, you, you obviously Jesse Bates is going to go, but I feel like it was a big mistake to let Von Bell go. And that all proved out. I think it was a big mistake to bring Joe Mixon back, even though they brought him back at a cheaper, uh, you know, contract. Um, to think Irv Smith could just come in. To think or the tight and that, that would be that would know? be my fifth spot. Right. And again, these are multiple positions when it comes to the lines, but. And then, yeah, then, then that, that was my fifth spot was tight end. If you look at the, the playoff teams, almost every one of the playoff teams, uh, they, well, they, they can run the ball and they can stop the ball. And they, they all, they all, uh, most of them have a really good tight end. Mm-hmm. Um, I know the, the, the Ravens tight end is hurt. Uh, but Andrews, Isaiah but likely their backup has been fantastic. He's been great. Yeah, David and Joku for the Browns. And Joku's George been fantastic. Kittle. I mean, he's he's Sam, really made. He's really helped resurrect Joe Flacco. Sam Laporta, uh, Dalton Kincaid. Like, yep. It's it's going to be like almost sickening for Bengals fans to watch in the playoffs because so many of these teams have these tight ends, and it goes back to your conversation and why I don't think ta- the only reason you put the tag on T Higgins is if you're going to trade him. It is not worth $21 million to pay T. Higgins for one more season. I, I, I you, agree. You have got to use that money in places elsewhere. And I think that the Bengals have to be, I think when you look at the most successful franchises in terms of consistency, yeah. not just two years um, and then they miss the playoffs. Like if you want to be a consistent contender, you have to look at the draft the same way and free agency the same way every year. And you can't just be, do recency bias where it was like, just because Joe Burrow got Hayden Hurst to have his best year, that means yeah. that the, the following year you can just throw a couple million at the tight end position and think Joe can just do that with everyone. Like yep. it needs to be of the same standard at this, at these positions. And if the player isn't meeting that standard, you know, you you don't sign him like they need to to take that approach in my opinion not yeah. fall in love with the years past results and think that that could just not it's like you all we heard this off season was the Bengals don't value the safety position they're not going to pay they're not going to pay what did you well, hear at nauseum this year the Bengals really need better safety play it's yeah. a really important position in Louisiana Rumo they need to whatever 
are their staples. It needs to remain the same regardless of if the price goes up or down. And I'm and I know they're yeah. going to have to take some lumps with Joe's contract, but that means you've got to hit harder on the draft picks. Yeah, and that's where that comes in in terms of and it's a question that I, I'll ask Duke Tobin at the Senior Bowl in a couple of weeks. Do you need to reevaluate the way you're evaluating the trench play in terms of your pre-draft process? Because if you go back through the last five years, specifically on the defensive line and the offensive line, they have not hit. Yeah. They haven't hit. And you look at the best teams in the NFL, they just are constantly restocking those positions. And if they decide... We we don't think we can hit on the draft this year, and that then that's where the money should go in free agency. Right, and and I think you, you make bring up a great point. I think I don't think I, I because they've missed on so many offensive linemen in the draft. It then caused them to go out and spend tens of millions of dollars the past two off seasons on. Kappa on Karras on uh, Brown and then you look at okay so then that sucks up a lot of resources then that you know those ideally could have been or you know a couple of those guys you know maybe one of them could have been a free agent the other two you developed on your own out of the draft well then look how much money could have then gone elsewhere to um and, and I bet you can go down the list of every NFL team and say, wow, they really missed on that that position or that uh, that position group. And oh, OK, uh, but the Bengals have consistently missed on uh, on the offensive line. And you're, you're just you're just not going to con- you're not you're not going to attain that goal that uh, Zach Taylor said the other day to win the Super Bowl uh, without being better in the trenches. And you're right. I, I had another thought in mind here. Um, um, uh, you know, I, I, it, yeah, you talk about premise and where to go. And, and I think, too, and uh, the Bengals have to start from the the thought that they need to fix things whether Joe Burrow is going to be healthy or not and so you I don't think they can look at it as like oh well Joe's going to be back next year and that's going to fix a lot of things yeah Joe is going to be back I, I mean you've you've written great stuff great scoop great exclusives on his injury you, I'm yeah I mean as look he's I think he's going to be back next year right but I'm talking about them working from the premise of that remove that premise because I, I i feel like if they fix these other areas joe burrow back yeah i think you are in position to be a team that can win the super bowl even with joe burrow back you don't fix these positions yeah maybe you're a playoff team maybe a eek in um but i wouldn't i wouldn't take those chances i completely agree and just to finish our thoughts on the trench play like if you say we don't, if you have, if you do a self assessment and you say, you know, we're really not good at drafting offensive or defensive linemen, I'm fine with them going out and spending all their money on the offensive line. Like the single most important thing for this team will be as long as he's here. It's like Tom Brady, can you get your offensive line as good as possible? Yep. But if that's going to be the strategy, then that puts that much more emphasis on if you're going to spend all your cash there, you got to hit on the draft picks. And you, you've got to hit on people like yeah. Dax Hill. You can't take a lump with a first rounder right. like that and move on from someone. Jesse Bates went on to be a pro bowler this year. Right, exactly. So, I mean, yeah, I saw a stat the other day with Jesse Bates, uh, first player since 2003, so 20 years, to get 125 tackles and six interceptions it's pretty pretty impressive um we're talking about the trenches and the defensive line we you see, you know the, the the trenches the, the the both both sides of the of the the line of scrimmage are so critical right um 
if the Bengals had been better there, Trey Henderson was great. If the Bengals across the board had been better there this year, maybe that would have taken a little pressure off of the some of the issues in the secondary. Uh, part of that was injuries. Obviously, you lost DJ Reader down the stretch. Uh, Sam Hubbard, God love him, banged up uh, a lot this season, fought through a lot of injuries. I mean, he's, he's showing some wear and tear. Uh, what was this? This was his sixth sixth season, I believe. Um and so you've got to take that into consideration out. Sam Hubbard showing some wear and tear. Uh, I still think there's, I still think he's a solid player and he's got good, good play left in him. But the wear and tear of Sam Hubbard, DJ reader, injury prone, same injury uh, he's had the last couple seasons. Uh, was it two seasons ago? I believe he had that same injury. He's a free agent. So you've got to address the middle, that defensive tackle position. But when we talk about injuries, then let's go to then, and it goes back to the draft. And this year, the guys that you drafted to plug in there in case these guys got hurt or they can't play every snap, obviously, uh, Joseph Osai and uh, Miles Murphy, those guys were generally non-factors this year. And they should have been uh, – Miles Murphy, I think they took him on more as like it was going to take some time. But, uh, you know, Joseph Osai should have been really clicking there, and it just didn't happen. And so that, again, goes back to the draft. And, again, like, you know, you keep hammering on it. I, I know Dave Lapham talks a lot about it, just the, the importance of being – really strong on both sides of the line of scrimmage. Well, it's the reason why Pittsburgh, and I'm kind of sick of people laughing when you bring up Pittsburgh and how bad they are because they are in the playoffs with Mason Rudolph and they whooped the Bengals at the line of scrimmage yep. and some other teams because they are, they're not all stars. I mean, they had TJ Watt is outstanding and Cam Hayward's, really good and so is Alex Highsmith but on the offensive line and the defensive line like they're, they're just foundationally sound there yeah and so that helped them get in the playoffs because when they were trying to figure out is Kenny Pickett going to start Mason Rudolph um, you know like they could lean on the trench play because yeah. it's a, it's consistent it's never it, it, like a it wasn't an issue for them so you look at I just wanted to pull these up since we're talking about the draft the 2021 draft class for the Bengals. Jamar Chase, Jackson Carmen, Joseph Osai, Cam Sample, Tyler Shelvin, Deontay Smith, Evan McPherson, Trey Hill, Chris Evans, Wyatt Hubert. The only two players that are anything for this team is Jamar Chase and Evan McPherson. Jackson Carmen. Never worked out. Joseph Osai doesn't look like that's going to work out for them. Cam Samples, a decent backup, but not, in my opinion, someone guys aren't even here. who, yeah, that you can hang your hat on. Tyler Shelvin's not even on the team anymore. Um, Deontay Smith, inactive last week. Evan McPherson, great. Trey Hill, same thing. Chris Evans, same thing. These guys are non factors. And then I look at like a draft class, like the Rams, like the Rams haven't had a first round pick the last couple of years, but their draft class last year, they got their starting guard, Steve Avila, their third round pick was uh, uh, their starting outside linebacker, Byron Young, who's been great. Their, their second third round pick is this guy, Kobe Turner, who people could say he's the defensive player of the year, yeah. a young interior, interior defensive lineman. Then they got Puka Nakua, Nakua yeah. the wide receiver. Like, It's been fantastic. That's a great draft for them. Yeah. The Bengals need a, that type of draft this year because it'll set them up yeah. for moving forward. And, and, respectfully anyone anyone could take Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase at the first pick and you know I it, you're gonna you're gonna hit yeah, <laughs> like, right but it, it's really a lot of those that middle round mm -hmm. uh you know second through the rest of it uh is is where they've just got to improve and pretty three four five in there and right. just be they've 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 got to get better mm -hmm. um well the good news is is we will have a lot of months 
before the draft yeah. and free agency to, to talk about it. Um, You'll be so heading down the senior bowl. Senior here. bowl in a couple weeks. The next thing you know, it'll be the combine. Um, but I just wanted to bring you on to get your final thoughts yeah. as we kind of close the chapter of this Bengals season. So, as always, um, Jason and I will not be stopping our coverage on the Bengals. We are a year round team in terms of covering the Bengals. Um, so, be sure to keep us bookmarked, Cincinnati.com. Jason's going to be focused more on college basketball and red spring training, but the Bengals will always be in Absolutely. the back of his head. And if you have any other questions about the Bengals, Jason has a inbox style column. Do you want to tell people a little yeah, bit about it? Uh, and this has been really popular with readers. Uh, people have been emailing me a lot about the Bengals. I've got another one coming up here and it's, it's my, my inbox is overloaded with Bengals questions, Bengals comments. I say, keep them coming. J Williams at inquirer.com. And I'm picking, uh, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of times it's the same topic, but I'm picking a couple and then responding, which in some ways I'm responding to everyone when they're asking me about those things. But uh, I had one last week in which, it, I mean, the floodgates were open. There were so many different readers uh, and subscribers saying, I think this is the problem. No, I think that in other words, this is a problem. And so we, I just addressed all, I threw it all out there and said, this is uh, great, and I don't I don't use your name. I just take your your email, um, and then I respond to it and, and on Cincinnati.com every week. Awesome. Well, Jason, thanks for joining me. Thank you. And we will be back um, taking a couple of weeks off here to recover from the season, but we'll be back with new episodes of the Bengals Beat Podcast from the Senior Bowl at the end of January. Thanks for tuning in.